Okay, I think we can start today's uh, session. So I would like to welcome everyone to our uh, final event, the class final event uh, with the title A Novel Software Architecture for Real-Time Smart Cities. We are uh, very excited to welcome you to our final event today. This is a special uh, occasion for us. It's not just our final event, it's also the last day of the project. So we're both happy and sad to see this project finishing, but um, we are mostly excited to welcome you all today and um, to let you know of what we've been working on for uh, all these years. So. Um, Welcome and enjoy the event. I am Nicoleta Chiapidu. I'm the dissemination leader of the class project uh, based at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I will be moderating the event today. And uh, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Uh, of course, we have Eduardo Quinones from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, who is the class coordinator. We also have Luca Ciantone from Comune di Modena, Mara Tonietti from Maserati, Erez Haddad from IBM Research Haifa, Ruth Palmero from Atos, Roberto Cavicioli from uh, Unimore, and Eli Karczakli from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. They're all uh, class partners, so we have a, a diverse panel uh, who will explain you all about the class software architecture and use case. I'll go through the agenda very quickly. So after this very short welcome, uh, Eduardo will give an overview of the class project. Then we have a very uh, exciting presentation about the smart city and connected cars uh, use case with a live demo in the smart urban area of the Modena city. We will then have a short coffee break and we will continue with a bunch of presentations on the class uh, data analytics platform, cloud computing, edge computing, uh, the software architecture, and we will finish with the Q&A slot and the concluding remarks, uh, remarks again from Eduardo Quinones, our coordinator. So just before we start with the actual presentations, I will just uh, I would like to give you some housekeeping rules, let's say. So um, the, the session is being recorded at the moment and the recording will be posted on our website and social media right after the event finishes. There will be time for question, uh, questions after each presentation. So we will welcome all your questions and comments, but there will also be um, general Q&A slot uh, at the very end of this session. You can ask your questions using the Q&A function on the Zoom window. So that, that would be very helpful for us to collect all the, your questions there. You can also use the chat if you want. And uh, if you would like to speak out loud, you can click on raise hand and I will unmute you. Um, basically this, could happen during the, the larger uh, Q&A slot we have at the end of the session. But uh, if you do that, just bear in mind that the session is being recording, recorded. And if you have any questions throughout the event, just don't hesitate to chat with the panelists or uh, send us an email at class project at bse.s. And that's from my side. I will stop uh, sharing my screen now and I think we can go ahead with Edu's uh, presentation. Edu, I give the floor to you to give us an overview of the class project. Thank you very much, Nicoleta. Um, thank you, everyone, to join uh, this final class dissemination event. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here in Modena. In fact, this is the first uh, trip um, I, myself is doing in the last uh, year, so for me and as well as for other members of the team, it is very special to be here in Modena, finally, in this final dissemination event. Okay, so in my presentation, um, 
uh, I'm going to talk, I want to provide an overview of the class uh, project, focusing mainly on the key innovation that the class project is providing. Uh, that is uh, a software architecture for the development, deployment, and execution of uh, complex data analytics workflows. Before, let me start with just providing a very quick, a quick overview about uh, what's class. So class is an edge 2020 object. The name class stands for edge and cloud computation and a highly distributed software architecture for big data analytics. Um, it is. It has been a 42 month project. It was extended because of the because of the COVID, and the overall budget uh, has been four million euros. Um, so, class is about how, from the data collected um, by the different sensors in the city, we can generate knowledge valuable knowledge that then the city can use. Um, so for example, we can have an image of, of a camera. And then from this image, we can, for example, uh, determine the different objects, determine the trajectories, and then, for example, uh, detect potential collisions before it happened. Or we can also, based on the dynamics properties of the different objects, we can compute in real time a map uh, of the estimation of the level of pollution in a given area of the city. And to do this, what we need to do is to define a data analytics workflow in which the, in which the data is processed by different methods until providing the knowledge we are, we are interested in. For example, in this case, in order to detect poten potential collisions, we would need to detect objects, track them, predict the trajectory all of all them, and then identify whether there is a collision or not. And if we want to de determine the level of pollution, we need to run uh, simulation models based on the dynamics of the different detected objects, we can determine what is the level of uh, pollution in a given time. Doing this for a single image, it's quite simple. But when we are focused in a smart city, there are a set of challenges that makes this process more difficult. Why is that? Because first thing, we don't have a single source of data. We have many different sources of data. So data sources are geographically distributed. And so that analytics requirements are also geographically distributed. Moreover, um, some of the uh, functionalities Smart Cities wants to, wants to implement requires real-time requirements to fulfill real-time requirements. This means that the end-to-end -end response time of the workflow needs to be in a given time budget in order to guarantee the correct operation of the functionality, okay? And so providing this in a distributed environment is very, very complex. So in this example, for example, we have four different data sources. Each of those is going to be computed, uh, is going to, to process a given workflow. In this case, what we need? We need to have a distributed environment combining both edge computing and cloud computing. At the edge computing level, we are, we are going to have very limited computation capabilities. But the response time is going to be very fast because we are not suffering in any, commun any communication delay. On the other side, on the cloud computing side, we are having high computation capabilities, but suffering uh, due, to, due to the communication. So in order to really take benefit of this, what we call the compute continuum, we need to efficiently coordinate the edge and cloud resources such that the workflows that are executed provides the result in the time uh, needed, in, 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 the, in, the, in the time it, it required. 
And this is exactly the vision of class. That is, if we have, if we are able to distribute the complex data analytics workflows across the compute continuum, we will in significantly increase the capabilities of data analytics. And the key element is here is to allow us to integrate both responsive data in motion analysis, as well as data address analytics into single, into single complex workflow. One key element is the use of not only cloud resources, but also um, advanced parallel and energy efficient edge computing platforms. So we can provide at the edge level the required computing capabilities in order to implement the data in motion analytics. And of course, all this needs to be uh, given in real time. And if there is uh, a word, an important word that uh, the class project has been pursuing is the word productivity. Class is about enhance, enhancing the software development productivity of complex uh, data analytics workflows from three different angles. From a, a programmability angle, meaning we facilitate the developer to describe the workflow. From a portability and scalability angle, meaning this workflow is, com is developed completely independent of the underlying platform, meaning that if the platform changes, the workflow will still execute. And of course, we want performance. We want to execute our, uh, our workflows uh, as fast as possible, providing real-time guarantees. And how CLASS has implemented this vision? This vision has been implemented by developing uh, uh, what we call the CLASS software architecture that integrates technologies from different computing domains. Um, um, and all this has been integrated into a single uh, development framework. So we have on one side, a powerful API that allow us to, uh, to develop, to describe, uh, to include the, the, the data analytics methods into a workflow based on both uh, task-based uh, parallel programming models and map uh, reduce uh, programming model. We, are, we have also provided or advanced orchestration mechanisms with time predict, taking time, time predictability into account that allow us to deploy and uh, schedule this workflow across the compute continuum. We have also provided quality of service serverless and container as a service cloud technology in order to extend this concept of real time at the cloud level. And of course, we have also, we are using the most advanced edge processor architectures in order to provide computing muscle to the edge layer as well. So we can provide this at real time response. Uh, so here you can see a picture of the different technologies uh, we, have, we have integrated into the software architecture that along this presentation uh, we are going to uh, we are going to design. And then this project has also a use case, a very challenging but exciting use case. So we have used uh, this um, our uh, class software architecture in order to develop advanced urban mobility functionalities and deploy them into the modern automotive smart area in the city here in the city of um, Modena. Uh, Masa is a living lab urban uh, area that includes IoT connectivity and a compute continuum infrastructure in order to execute our workflows. And, and we have also two connected cars equipped with uh, sensors, cameras, and either in order to understand the surroundings and also communication with the crew. 
And with this infrastructure, what we have done is we have developed two use cases uh, that we really hope we will be able to, uh, to show you um, that shows how the information that is collected from the city and the information is collected from, from, the, from the vehicle, we can uh, provide an advanced driving assistance systems based on collision detection. And also we can compute the level of pollution in a given area in real time. And just to conclude my talk, let me just provide uh, a snapshot, okay? Of what are you going to see? Would they? So, as I said before, class is about is about facilitating the deployment, uh, the sorry, the development, deployment, and execution of advanced workflows. So, um, in this video here, and this video, you are you are going to and you are going to see it along the different presentations. We want to implement, we want to detect when two cars uh, can potentially collide. In order to implement this, you need a set of methods, data analytics methods that you need to combine among them from the data sources, you need to combine among them, them in order to provide the valuable knowledge that you need, in this case, determining a collision. What CLASS has done is first, it facilitates the development by describing your functionality as a workflow in which the data flows across them and generates the knowledge needed. We are also deploying this. So determining what is the best, um, the, the best um, computing resource in which the different uh, data analytics methods must execute in order to minimize the execution time minimize communication latency and provide a real time with requirements. And finally, we execute using the different technologies uh, included in the class software architecture. All this is going to be explained across uh, uh, along the different um, presentations uh, you are going to see today. So thank you very much. And if there is any question. Thank you, Edu, for uh, this overview. Uh, it was a great way to start our event today. So let's see if there are any questions at the moment. As I said in my short introduction, people can use the chat if they like. Uh, they can use the Q&A function as well. It's the option you can see at the bottom of your Zoom window. So let's see if anyone has any initial question. If not, I think um, we can continue with the next presentation. I'm just going to share my screen very quickly to um, show the agenda. Just um, a reminder of the agenda. So uh, we will go ahead, as Edu mentioned, with the smart city use case. Now we have a presentation by Luca Ciantore. Mara Tonietti and Eduardo Quinones. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very exciting uh, part of our event today. And we're gonna show a live demo as well. So I'll give the floor to our three speakers now uh, who will have their short presentations. And then, as I said, we will uh, attempt a live demo with the Maserati cars in the smart uh, urban area of the Modena city. So let's uh, start with Luca. I think Luca is ready. Yes, I'm ready. Well, Thank the you floor is much. yours, Luca. OK, I'm ready. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, I'm Luca Chiantore, the Chief Information Officer of the City of Modena and uh, the, also the Smart City Manager. It's a great uh, pleasure for us uh, to host uh, the smart city use case uh, of the class project. Uh, 
a brief uh, introduction to the city of Modena. The city of Modena is a, a small city that uh, join uh, culture, tradition, uh, in general, good life, uh, uh, beautiful car, because we have uh, a lot of beautiful cars, and also innovation. Uh, there is uh, a very important document uh, for us, uh, our digital plan, uh, approved uh, by the City Council in uh, 2020. Uh, in this uh, uh, digital uh, plan, uh, we define the pillar of the digital innovation in the city. And uh, as you can see, we have uh, uh, three pillars. Uh, the first one uh, uh, about uh, digital infrastructure. The second one uh, about uh, um, online services for, for citizens. And the third one is about uh, strategic projects. CLASS for us uh, is uh, a very, very important project, is a strategic project. In general, uh, European projects uh, uh, are um, uh, very important, in particular in uh, the innovation field. Uh, we have also another very, very important project for us, that is the, the MASA project, the, the Modern Auto Automotive Smart Area project. And CLASS and MASA join we have a link, a straight link between these two projects. And then I will describe why. MASA. MASA is our, um, our program of development in the field of research for, for automotive and for new devices, for a new mobility, for a safer mobility, a green mobility. And uh, in the in the MASA project, uh, we we have uh, uh, of course uh, technical skill about artificial intelligence, uh, cybersecurity, uh, research group uh, of course, uh, uh, artificial in intelligence, cybersecurity, real time or research on real time because we need uh, a real time response uh, to develop this kind of devices, but also skill. Uh, uh, in, in a low field and uh, in economics, uh, so a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, MASA project uh, join uh, join class because uh, the MASA project uh, uh, is a sort of uh, living lab. Um, uh, this living lab is uh, close to the center of the city. You can see the map is a sort of uh, um, urban race, racetrack a ring with uh, some very important uh, point for our research uh, for a roundabout, a bridge, uh, and uh, some other uh, uh, interesting point because uh, they are near to uh, uh, an hospital and uh, the new data center of the city. This living lab has fundamentally three, three elements, three assets, a sensing infrastructure, a communication infrastructure, and a computing infrastructure. All these assets are at disposal of the class, of the class project. In detail, the communication infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, all, all the area, in all the area there is uh, a, a network, uh, many network, uh, a wired network uh, in uh, fiber optical, um, the, the red segment uh, in the map, and uh, uh, some wireless network. Uh, in particular, we have uh, a 5G antenna, uh, a 4.5, uh, a 4G antenna, private uh, 4G infrastructure. This antenna is uh, on the highest building in the in the area, um, and and also a lower antenna for uh, um, devices that, that doesn't need real time real time approach. Then we have a sensing infrastructure. In the map, you can you can see where where uh, the element fundamentally. We have a, a camera, traditional camera, uh, that use uh, uh, 
uh, the edge node uh, named fog node <laughs> to, to um, extract information and value from images and uh, give this uh, data, this information to the, to, uh, to the class uh, uh, software architecture. Uh, then we have also um, smart camera. Uh, smart camera are camera with a GPU on board and uh, they can uh, elaborate, they can uh, compute uh, information on board of this device. And then we have also pollution uh, uh, sensor, parking sensor and so on. The computing infrastructure, finally, we have also a, a new data center the, in the region, in the Emilia-Romagna region. Now we have uh, four public uh, data center. Modena is uh, uh, the last one. And uh, inside this uh, data center, we use uh, a lot of um, computing uh, resources. So we have uh, a virtual infrastructure and uh, a lot of uh, virtual machine. To, to create the city cloud, but also we have uh, the, the edge node uh, on the road uh, um, to, to support uh, a, a computation uh, on the road. So we have uh, computing uh, resources uh, at the edge node and also on the cloud. Uh, finally, we have uh, we have defined uh, also in the in the project uh, a data model, because uh, of course uh, uh, when we manage uh, uh, images, uh, uh, we need uh, to be very very pay attention, uh, strict attention to uh, uh, regulation, uh, privacy regulation in general to the GDPR. So we defined uh, a, a policy. Uh, we uh, we collect uh, an only anonymous, anonymous uh, uh, data, so not personal data. Uh, we have uh, defined three levels of uh, that data set. Uh, the first one is uh, a disaggregated level. So we, we record for a short time uh, the position of uh, an object uh, and the timestamp, but then uh, we have a uh, two, two level of uh, aggregation. So after uh, a day, we aggregate uh, this uh, this record, uh, and then uh, we we do another level of aggregation. This to to um, be sure that uh, uh, we can. Uh, have a full uh, compliance uh, with uh, GDPR rules. In the last slide, the last one, stop. Okay, in the last slide, you can see the, the data flow. So in, uh, in our uh, area, we have uh, uh, a city uh, infrastructure with, uh, uh, with uh, an edge level and a cloud level, but also we have car. So now I, I give the floor uh, to, Maz, to Mara for uh, her presentation. Also car are sensor. So uh, in class project car can uh, uh, talk with uh, the city, okay? My, my presentation is finished. If uh, someone uh, has a Thank question. You. Thanks very much, Luca. Thanks very much for this. So it was great to hear about the view of the city um, for the class project. And I think we can go ahead with Mara's presentation straight away. And if there are any questions, we can um, check them after the live demo. So uh, as I said before, if there are any questions during the presentations, feel free to click on the Q&A and ask them there or use the chat. Um, but we will allow questions uh, after, after this uh, session, I think. So maybe we can continue with Mara's presentation. 
once she's ready. And Mara is going to talk about the Maserati cars and how they're censored and how they're used in the project. So Mara, whenever you're ready, I give the floor to you. Okay. Okay. So perfect. thank you very much, uh, Nicoletta, for the introduction. And thank you for all the team to make this project possible. It was a pleasure for us to join this, uh, this project. Um, I'm Mara Tonietti, I'm representing Maserati inside this project. And so I would like to give you a brief overview uh, regarding the connected cards and sensing components. Within the class project, Maserati has provided three connected vehicles to the project. The first one uh, is a Maserati Quattro Porte, that is a luxury sports sedan vehicle. And uh, it was provided at the beginning of the project in January 2018. The second vehicle is a Maserati Levante, a mid-size uh, luxury crossover SUV. And uh, it was provided uh, in September 2018. The last vehicle was provided last year in June 2020 and is another uh, Maserati Quattro Porte vehicle. Uh, all, both uh, Quattro Porte vehicles uh, are equipped with uh, a software for a LiDAR on the vehicle roof. And all the three vehicles are equipped with a full package uh, ADAS, uh, so Advanced Driver Assistance System um, optional package. Um, Regarding the sensing components, each vehicle includes a set of sensors device to give information regarding the position of the vehicle, the speed, and the typology of the object that surround the vehicle. Uh, in addition to this data, the vehicle will provide also information uh, from the vehicle can network and uh, um, including also so the acceleration, collision, and the break, uh, emergency brake information. All these components integrated uh, with the computing platform will allow the, the vehicle to, have, uh, to perform three main tasks. Have a complete perception of the surroundings, have information regarding the vehicle positioning uh, compared to the one already uh, given by the vehicle, and finally, uh, have information about the infrastructure uh, through the B2E uh, communication. The uh, surrounding perception is made uh, using six different uh, high performance cameras. Four of these cameras are, have uh, a field of view of uh, 120 degrees, and uh, uh, two have uh, a field of view of 60 degrees. Um, the car also are equipped with one LiDAR. Uh, to detect the object uh, uh, around the vehicle and uh, uh, three radar already equipped in the car and also uh, parking sensors already equipped in the cars to have a perception about the, the surroundings. Um, so for the vehicle positioning, uh, inside this project we use the GPS and so we uh, have information from the vehicle through the maps and the GPS and finally uh, as mentioned before, we have information about the infrastructure, so the, the surroundings of the car, uh, using a 4G antenna for the B2E communication. Uh, finally, each vehicle includes a, a powerful high-performance computing plat platform. Um, this uh, uh, allows to implement uh, all the data from uh, the uh, rather uh, LiDAR and cameras. And uh, uh, in particular, for the first prototype, uh, we uh, used the, the NVIDIA Drive PX2 Auto Chauffeur. For the second vehicle, uh, the AGX Xavier. And for the third vehicle, the AGX Pegasus. So we are using three different platforms to make uh, a diffusion between all these components and to have uh, uh, real-time information regarding the, the data uh, from the surroundings and the vehicle. Um, this is, uh, as mentioned before, a brief uh, overview about the, the cars and all the components that are equipped in the car. So I leave uh, just time for question and answer if you have. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much uh, to, to everyone. 
Thanks, thanks very much, um, Mara. Thanks for sharing the perspective of Maserati in the project. So uh, I think we can have the live demo now and then we can allow some time for questions right after. So we wrap up this, uh, this um, slot nicely. So um, as I said, after Lucas and Mara's presentations, we're going to attend the live demo with the, our Maserati cars in the Massa, which is the smart city area in Modena, as uh, Luca mentioned. And right after this live demo, we will allow time for questions. So let's um, try to go for the live demo. I'm going to um, I'm going to spotlight the uh, Maserati car that is currently in the Massa and also the, the Massa area as well. So I think now it's all viewed nicely. Is that correct? Yes. We can we can see it nicely. Great. So I give again the floor to you, Edu, and uh, hey, thank you very much, Nicoletta. The rest of the people, and we start with this uh, slot. Okay. So thank you. Uh, now is probably the most challenging part of the presentation, um, since we are going to test with what we have been developed. Um, so now Ancesco is uh, showing one of one of the cars that we are uh, that we have been experimenting with. Uh, there is also another car in other part of in other part. Francesco, you see that that he's just running. <laughs> so then you can see the other car that is exactly over there. Okay. Um, uh, and this is the other uh, the other car that uh, we have been experimenting with. And this car you will see it is a Quattro Porte uh, vehicle and with the cameras mounted and with uh, either mounted on on top of it as well. And with these two cars and the information collected from uh, a, a camera, we will try to do. Uh, a demo. Um, I hope it will work as smoothly and it has been working uh, the, 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 the last days, but with the demo, you never know. Okay, so then um, if you can make my presentation bigger so we can focus on my presentation only, and then we will go back. Uh, so Nicoletta, would you mind to spotlight only my presentation? Sure. sure. Thank you. So then we can do my presentation. Thank you. Okay, Thank you done. Much. No problem. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, the the um, the demo is going to occur in the into the Modena Automotive Smart Area, um, and we are going to consider uh, for this demo a uh, three cameras spotting. Uh, three different parts of uh, the city. The cars are in camera number one, okay? So at the end, all the analysis of the results, we are going to focus on the, on the camera number one, uh, but the rest of the cameras, I mean, but we are al also going to show you uh, what is going on uh, in, the, in the other cameras, although we are not going to see uh, videos for, uh, for a GDPR. Isms. So, as I said, uh, um, okay, no, wait a second. Um, okay, yes. Um, okay, so um, the video you are going to see is precisely this one. Okay, the, the demo you are going to see is precisely this one. So, we are going to have the two cars that are advancing. Okay, the camera, the, the cities from the cameras. Plus, uh, plus the, the the sensors from the car are going to identify the surroundings, uh, uh, and hopefully, um, are going to detect that a collision has occurred. 
sometimes it happens sometimes it not because you know the two cars needs to to do it very smoothly you know in order to reproduce that uh, collision is going to occur and of course we are going not to collide the two the two the, the two the two cars um so um can we then move to the 3d visualizer okay so what so what what you are seeing here is uh is um uh the real time of what's going on in this area right now what you see is the two it's the two the two cars okay the levante car with the lights uh so over to you you perhaps can zoom in <coughs> precisely and then uh the quattro porte and then uh, around the quattro porte you can see that there are things spotting around this is the information that the that the quattro porte detects um then the information from the, the from the cameras from the city are not spotted okay why is that because this is still not active we will activate now we will execute the we will execute the workflow now okay so uh, then you can see um and then you will see how the different uh, spots i mean how the different information collected from the city and from and from the vehicles uh, are shown in this uh, 3d uh, 3d demo we are also going to spot a uh, different different parts of of the city mark uh, Alberto, can you show the other parts? This is the other the, the other part that you are not seeing anything because, as I said, cameras are not yet active, and this is the other the other part. Okay, so let's move back. This is one car. This is the other car with the information that is being collected. Okay, and let's go back to this place. Okay, okay, good. So let's then start. So, and Nicoleta, before, can you please uh, spotlight? The two sure. Yes. Sure. Yes. So, so then gonna, you can also uh, see what's going on. One camera this is now. the car, and okay, this is perfect. and this is the panoramic view. Okay. So, okay. Let's so, rock. Benamino, you can start. Eudal, start. Okay. So you see. Guido. Guido, bye. So you see the two cars are approaching. Now you are starting to see that there are there are there are there are uh, there have been warnings across there. They may be uh, potential situations of risk. They may not be. You see here that there is also things running on at, in, in this camera and in this camera as well. There are spotlights and 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 things that the cameras from the city have been detected. And now uh, the car um, is going back to the uh, to the position. Um, okay, so um, um, what we are going to to do now? Uh, um, so um, if you can um, now, Nicoleta, no, Nicoleta, no. Can you just show again my presentation? Okay. Okay, so this is the live demo. Okay, so during this execution, we have been collecting all the logs. So then you will see what has actually occurred. Okay, um, and then what we are going uh, to do now is, as I said, collecting all this data and producing the videos, new videos, in order you can you you can see what what has uh, up, happened. But just to give you an idea of what you are going to see, okay? Um, in in my presentation, in the in in the left part, this is what we are. This is our target, okay? Uh, so, Nicoleta, perhaps could can can you please uh, spotlight my my um, presentation sure, again? You. Okay, I'm doing it now. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. So the first presentation, this is what we call um, an idealistic execution. So we have taken, this was uh, a test we did in, in April, May, 
uh, once we had the pandemic uh, allowed us to, to, do, to, do, to do the tests. And then we, we, we ran like many times these tests in order to reproduce a collision. Okay, so the two cars were approaching uh, like, like very, very close in order to, 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 to reproduce a collision. Okay, and this was, the, uh, this was the result. And this is what we are producing now. So you see the two cars are approaching, the two cars are approaching, we are computing the trajectories, and you see that the black spotlight, this black spotlight is that determines the collision, okay? So we have been computing the trajectories of, of the two vehicles, we have completely removed the rest of the information collected. So we focus only on, on, on of our interest. This is our point of interest. Now trajectories are computed and you see you are, we are uh, computing the trajectory. This is of course, let's say the, the, the ideal scenario, okay? But in reality, what is happening is that all these workflows, okay, are going to be deployed, are, are going to be executed across the compute continuum. And so uh, there are interferences among them, there is delay among the different, uh, the different, uh, uh, the different X, the different executions. And so what you see on your right uh, part of, of, uh, of, the, of the image is uh, is what we obtain with the exact same video, uh, but this time executing um, executing um, only with one camera only. So no, with two cameras only. So you see that you're going to see that you see here there are, let me show it again. Uh, so in this area, we are going to see, here it is, okay. Uh, that we have been, uh, that there has been um, uh, potential collisions identified. This time you see that that the run is not that smooth because we were uh, um, reading from reading from uh, from uh, videos from the streaming of the cameras. Uh, we, we were uh, reading from the car. We were fusing the two information. We were computing trajectories of all the area. We were computing. Uh, collisions of all the area, and this is delaying, okay, the uh, execution. Um, so then, what I suggest now, and um, Icoleta, um, uh, that we make now mm -hmm. ten minutes break, so we can, um, as I said, collect all the information, collect all the all the videos we have recorded, make make sure that uh, we are not showing anything. Um, um, in 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 a video, and so when we are back from the coffee break, then we will show this uh, post mortem uh, analysis. Um, thank you, Edu. Just uh, would you like to have some questions first, because there there were a few that came up. So maybe we can have a short Q and A before the break. This is, a, this is indeed a very good question. Okay, uh, perfect. So. I'm going to let you share in your screen and I'm going to ask the first question that came up. So there is a question that says, that's a, that's a general one. So it says, if you started the project from the beginning, what would you do differently in the city, from the city perspective? Probably this uh, you can answer. Okay, I try to, to answer. Uh, for the city of Modena, uh, I saw challenging uh, project uh, like, like uh, uh, class was uh, a, a new experience, uh, a very, very positive experience because uh, we, we found a team, we create a team with uh, other partner. Uh, so for us, it uh, was, uh, was a pleasure. And, uh, and was uh, also very interesting uh, for uh, to, to develop uh, research and to, to provide uh, new services to citizens. Um, from my point of view, uh, uh, now I, I, I don't change uh, anything uh, in case of, uh, of a new project or a new 
class two project. Uh, the, the only, uh, the, the, the only, there is an, ele an element, uh, a technical element. Uh, now we, we have at disposal a 5G network. So some, some issues, some problem uh, with uh, latency are naturally solved. Uh, so uh, some uh, some uh, uh, feature are uh, easier to 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 de develop. But for me, for uh, the, the perspective of city of Moda, the experience was uh, great. Great, thank you, thank you. That's very positive. So um, I have a second. Me, sorry, let me let me comment also from a, from a sure. so of course there is the. The point of view of 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 uh, the city, but also from a uh, from a technical point of view, I would be also like to to mention um, something that I think if we would start the project now, we would do differently, um, and and this is mainly because of the trend we are observing in the edge computing. Uh, so when we started this project, we assumed that the edge com the edge Computing, so the, the the resources, the edge computing resources, were private to us. Okay, so we have full control of full control of of the of the edge nodes, and so we, we can do whatever we want. Um, so so the trend is it's it's more and, and more uh, to to try to to not not um, try to apply the same model in the cloud at the edge level, so that so that the the edge resources are not really proprietary only of the city. So in this case, the control you have over the resources is limited, okay? So something, and this is food for, of course, other, 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 other projects, is how do we do, how can we deal when the resources, especially the edge resources, are not as controlled as the one we have, we have, we, we we have now. What if there is there are other entities that provides the services to the city by offering edge resources to to the city? We have the city required to invest on them. In this scenario, we we will not have control over over them. How we can still uh, provide these uh, real time requirements? Great, thank you. Thanks, Edu. We have a few more that came. So the next question says, was the city camera also involved in this scenario or just the sensors of each car? Again? Oh, sorry, so I repeat, was the city camera also involved in the scenario or just the sensors of each car? No, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. There, 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 there were in fact three cameras. So you are going to see once we process um, um, that from the point of view of the city. So because what here, what we are going to show is the video of uh, recorded by one of the cameras uh, that this information provides uh, from 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 the city ha, ha, has been computed by the by the city as well as by the by the cars. Okay, okay, perfect. And uh, another one just came in that says, "Did you resolve the latency issues while exchanging data packages between the vehicles?" Um. Okay, class. So this is a, this is a good question. Um, class was not focused on uh, optimizing uh, the latency. Okay, um, we we have been focused on when you schedule. Okay, when you deploy your system and when and and when you schedule your uh, your workflow, you do it such in a way that. Uh, you minimize the impact of communication, and you uh, and you minimize the execution time as well as as well as the end-to-end -end response time either. But we have not been playing with uh, with communication, meaning we have not 
uh, implement any specific scheduling at communication level. Okay, so no five no five G technology, for example, has been exploited in the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. And I've got a last question, I think. So that one says, are you using an existing data model, JSON, ARXML, um, and only adding some patterns, for example, timestamp? Um, so I guess the question is that if we are using some some data model in in xml or json format i guess this is this is the question mm -hmm. okay so yes um, correct, correct so 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 yes uh so yes the answer the answer to this to this to to this question is yes this is specific this is implemented in python okay so, so the data model is implemented in python but it can easily be extracted as an XML or or uh, or uh, JSON. Uh, we initially considered to also um, use other type of more um, generic, let's say, uh, data models. Hardware, for example, is one is one is one of those. But we found that there were certain limitations because we really, as I said before, we really want to have full control, okay, as to see at, up to which time we can we can really provide this uh, real time re this real time requirements, and so we decided to just check at it, uh, but not but not using and and an use our own model. But if you check our model and, for example, the one that hardware provides are pretty pretty similar. Thank you. Thanks, Edu, for this. Uh, I think we can have a short break now. And uh, there are a few more questions that are coming, but let's have the break now. I think it's a, it's a good time. And uh, then we can continue with the rest of presentations. And I'm taking note of all the questions, and we will make sure to answer them right after. So if that's OK with all of you. Let's uh, have a short 10 minute break now. So we have a, have a short breath and we continue with the rest of the presentation. So stay tuned. Thank you. Okay, we're back, everyone. So thank you for staying with us and thank you for all the questions that uh, came during this time. So I think I'm gonna give the floor to Edu again. There you go. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so as I said before, uh, we just collected all the information we got, okay? And what we are going to show is the result of the execution, okay? Um, uh, and then we will make a very brief uh, live demo again with the pollution um, emission use, use case. So Eli, if you want to share your uh, screen so you can, so you can share with, um, with the uh, audience the result of the of the po of the post mortem analysis. Okay, so the execution was not 
as ba as good as we expected. In fact, there are uh, there are questions in the chat that are already uh, somehow spotting what you are going to see now. So whenever you want, Ellie. Yes. So this is what has occurred. Okay. So it's this is this is slow because we are right now processing all the information we could all the logs we we call it during this run that has been quite 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 large so you, know, you can see for example here that there is a car uh at this level that it is computed i it is computed the trajectories the one in the one in the one in a roundabout there is this car the maserati car that is that is uh, it is advancing sometimes the the dnn detects sometimes not but what you're going to see now is oh, there has been uh, 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 we miss frames, okay? Uh, so here can be because of two reasons, can be because, because of the connection with the camera or because of a saturation of the computing resources. This especially occurs at the beginning of the, of the, of the execution. Um, so then what we are going to show, because maybe with, with this video, you may have, you, you may have, a. um, uh, a bad behavior of uh, a demo, and so what? What I yesterday we we did I don't know like um, twenty tests, okay, and so we are we are going to 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 show you one of the tests uh, we did. So Ellie, if you want to 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 start, so this is this is this is a a, a, a video uh, a, a test we produced yesterday. So you can see that this time the, the, the two cars are collected, the, the, the trajectories are predicted. It is this red line, you see, because the Levante is advancing very, very slowly. Uh, the trajectory is very, very small. The Quattro Porte, it's, it's large. And you're, you're going to see very quickly that uh, a collision has been, uh, has been detected here, you, here you have and then it just passes, okay? This, this, this execution was done yesterday with three cameras as well. So it, it's exactly the same demo you have seen to today, uh, but this time with, uh, three, with, uh, with, um, with three cameras as well. Okay, so perhaps we can go quickly through the, through the questions posted. There are a number of them. So, uh, Nicoleta? Yes, so let's start with the questions that came up uh, also during the break. So the first one says, how to ensure that the data transferred back and forth is not lost or corrupted um, from vehicle to cloud? Yeah, there are here, there are two. two. So the answer to this is, uh, it is a trade-off between real time and, um, and uh, accuracy or uh, on a data. So all communications are based on UDP, which means that we are not guaranteed. Why is that? Because what we really want is we want to stream data as fast as, fast as possible and we process them trying to guarantee uh, real-time uh, real requirements. If we would introduce protocols that are more secure, Okay, and guaranteed, uh, at, I mean, and guaranteed um, the case when 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 the package are lost, we would be losing. Okay, so this uh, and those that are uh, and I see that are uh, people from the uh, audience are from the automotive domain. Uh, this is not a safety critical uh, system at all. Okay, this this is more a, a mission critical uh, or a quality of or a quality of service. And just to let you know, the the latency we are observing, so the end-to-end -end latency we are providing, it's in the order of hundred milliseconds. So um, so this this means that we can process ten frames per second. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I continue with the next question that says, has the class project um, any comparative KPIs between classic scenario and edge scenarios regarding 
to data flow reduction, reducing latency processing the data, etc. Um, okay. So if you recall my 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 presentation, the introduction, um, um, our objective, uh, one of the key elements we have been focused on, is on the productivity. So how we can facilitate the deployment, so the development, deployment, and execution of work. Okay. Um, we have not. We have focused, we have done our best in order to, 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 to include the, more, the, the most advanced uh, data, um, data analytics, but this has been not one of the cores, one of, one of the main, 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 main elements. And this is why, for example, there are some analytics that could, that could, that could be improved. So just to, just to uh, 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 you know what you have seen here, the DNN we have been using, it's YOLO3. And YOLO3, it's not the best one. So we could use YOLO4 or YOLO5 or YOLO6. OK. Um, but this is something that uh, as, 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 as a continuation of this, of this uh, project is, is, on, is on refining the analytics of, uh, of a workflow so we can really move to the, to the latest and the most advanced data analytics. Thank you. Thank you, Edu. I have another one that says, based on Maserati's overview of the sensor package, was the sensing or the perception sensor mounted on the car done from sensor itself, smart cameras, or the processing of the images and the clustering of LIDAR, LIDAR's point cloud was done completely with the cloud computation-based architecture? No, everything has been done on the car. In an NVIDIA Pegasus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's answered. And uh, there is one more question, but I think Roberto might kind of um, reply to that with his presentation that is coming up. The question says, how did you manage tracking with GDPR besides anonymous data? Do you track the object IDs uh, to follow the development of a potential conjecture? Is this something you would like to reply to now or maybe Roberto will take it? This, 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 this is going to be ad addressing Roberto's. Okay, okay. So uh, at this point, maybe we can finish this Q&A uh, part. OK, so then let's just make a very quick. Um, are we prepared for making uh, a quick uh, pollution demo? This is a yes or this is a no? Yes. OK, so Ellie, whenever you want, you can, you, you, you can share your uh, screen again. So this is so. So this is the only, the uh, the other uh, use case uh, uh, we were um, um, we were looking at. So so we have developed this dashboard uh, in which uh, we are uh, processing uh, the we are um, printing uh, a pollution map of the area in which we are uh, focused on. So as you can see, we are only. Uh, spotting two parts, okay, that are right now the, the cameras that are activated right now, and and this is based on the exact same workflow you have seen before, okay, for the for the for a determining um, uh, a possible a possible uh, collision. We are obtaining uh, the. Um, um, the execute the the the, the 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 dynamics characteristics of the vehicle, mainly um, uh, what is the speed and what is the act, what is the acceleration, uh, and based on this, we are uh, providing what is the level of pollution emitted in this area. You can see that we are focused on uh, different types of gas. We are focused on NOx. We can focus. We can focus also on CO. So, Ellie, can can you show one second the the the, the, the gas type? Uh, and you see, for example, there there has been refresh 
this means that this is, this is pro, pro, produced for, for now every five seconds, five, 10 seconds, if I recall. So we are uh, gathering the information during, uh, during five and 10 seconds, and we are generating an estimation of what is the level of pollution in real time. Okay, we can reduce this, uh, of course, as much as um, as much as uh, we want, but in order to make it uh, um, uh, valuable, okay, uh, we need to to have gathered data in in half 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 a minute, one 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 minute, okay. And this is the other uh, use case um, I uh, we would like to show the what what you have seen today is live um, execution. So this this the level of pollution right now in the in the city of Modena, in in the in the in the mass. Okay, so that's okay. all from uh, our side. So Thanks very much, Edu. I think we can wrap up the use case uh, presentation at this point. We answered quite a few questions already. So let me share my screen now to share again the agenda very quickly. So. We can continue with uh, the presentation of Ereth Haddad from IBM. Uh, Ereth will talk about the class data analytics platform deploying the big data analytics methods in the smart city. So um, we did receive a few more questions, but I think we will answer them with the next presentations, which are going to be on the data analytics platform, cloud and edge computing as well. So they are all no noted. Thank you very much to the ones that have asked questions already. So keep in mind, we will uh, make sure to reply to those. So if Eref is ready, I think we can. I'm ready, Nicoleta. With his presentation. Perfect. So the floor is yours, Eref. I stop sharing my screen. So uh, hi, everyone. I'm Eref. I'm from uh, IBM Research in Haifa. And I'm going to talk about the class uh, data analytics, the big data analytics methods in the smart city. So, um, let's see. Okay. So, um, before I, uh, so the, the, the purpose of this presentation is not really to bother you all with all the many technical details that involves the class analytics. What I really want to show you is just a few interesting highlights that that uh, have been uh, have been uh, learned and produced some of which as lessons during the uh, the entire uh, time of the class project. So I, I, I start first by showing you the direct application of these analytics in, in our main use case that Ed presented earlier, the, the, our V2X application of collision avoidance. So as you can see in, the, in this chart, there are quite a few analytics involved in doing the collision, in, in, in making collision avoidance happen. First, there are the sources of information. There are both the smart cars and there are the smart cameras deployed in the cities. Uh, both of which are, are being used as sources of information, and both of them are actually already running analytics, which Edu already mentioned in his talk. For example, for the cameras, we are running, uh, we are running one kind of analytics, which is the YOLO DNN. And for the smart cars, we have another type of analytics, which is the sensor fusion that's running on the cars. Both of these generate this stream. They, they take input that comes from various sensors and basically generate a stream of object, uh, of symbolic object representations of the, of the, the entities uh, running around in the massa, whether those are cars, pedestrians, bicycles, etc. Now, uh, each, of these, each of these objects is detected multiple times, obviously, when it's going through the various uh, locations in the massa. As such, a history is constructed for each such object. Based on this history, we can now predict the future movement of that object. This is the trajectory computation that you see in the next square done again on top of a lithops platform, which, uh, which is also part of another analytics platform that is part of class. Based 
on the, on the computed trajectories, we can now estimate the possibility of potential collisions, future collisions between entities. And specifically, those that we're interested in notifying about, these are the connected cars. Connected cars is a larger subset that covers both smart cars and cars that just have a means of being notified, but not necessarily produce any information. So this computation comes in the next box, which you see at the bottom, which is filtering and collision detection, where, uh, where we do both collision detection, but we do it on a filtered subset that pertains to the cars that later can be notified. So the result of this computation is actually collision notifications that can be later on sent to the cars. So how do we make all these various analytics communicate with one another efficiently? To this end, we actually have two means of doing so. One of them is they can communicate through the data backbone of class, which is data clay, shown at the bottom of the screen. The entire, the entire analytics is built on top of the comps and data clay. Another means of communication, which we introduced, which allows more direct communication between components, is based on a serverless infrastructure. We use Apache OpenWhisk. I'm going to explain a bit more what serverless is in the next slide. But in the meantime, I'd like you to just, to just, gra uh, to just uh, grasp the general concept where we have different components. For example, as you can see in the chart on the right side, we have a MapReduce, uh, MapReduce components using LithOps. We have um, a workflow components based on uh, comps. We have DNNs. We, have, we, we may have a complex event processing component. They all com uh, communicate with one, can, can communicate with one another directly using the serverless platform. And how is that? This is done by deploying, by having the, the application deployed as a, as a set of serverless functions. And then these functions can be either invoked directly using the serverless protocol or be bound to various events such as network events, sensor events, user input, or timer events, all of which are actually uniformly handled through the serverless protocol causing invocation of the said analytics backend and thereby causing a response, a response by computation. So what exactly is a serverless what exactly is a serverless platform? So I'm just going to give you a very very short example. So when you do serverless programming you basically start by writing a code function, an actual code function. In this example I'm showing a javascript example. You just you just have a function that that takes a parameter of a string and returns another string based on the input parameter. Okay? And then but this, this function has meaning only for a in, the, in, in the context of a JavaScript application. However, we want to invoke it globally using the serverless protocol. So to, to do that, we convert that code function into a serverless function, which is actually a microservice. And we do that by using, in, in the case of OpenWhisk, we use the whisk command to convert it to a globally accessible a, a, a function. Once this is done, we can now invoke this function just as we would do inside a JavaScript application, only now we can do this from any kind of application using the standardized uh, serverless protocol. So here you see an example of this function being invoked, but not, not only that, we can now take the same function and invoke and, and bind it to events. We, create an, we, we can create an event trigger, we can bind the same function to that event, and then any kind of event that happens on this, uh, on this event trigger, it's kind of a pop sub channel, will cause these function to be invoked. And, and as I said, going back to my previous slide, if, if this function happens to be a computation of lithops, a computation of comps, a computation of DNN, that, the, that computation happens in response to the event. And the magic of serverless is actually the, 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 the remo removing the need of the developer from messing with the infrastructure. That's actually the reason for the name serverless. You don't deal with the infrastructure, you don't deal with deployment. And furthermore, and as many events as are generated, so are as many function instances are created to handle those events. This is auto scaling, again, handled 
by the platform. So this all, this is all, uh, the, the, there is a bundle of advantages here that really play directly to one of the core premises of class, which is developer productivity. It's event driven. You, you, can, you can respond to event, you can do a direct invocation, auto scaling. The, deploy, the deployment of the function instances are actually isolated, which means you can deploy it on shared infrastructure safely, such as a commercial cloud. It's lightweight enough to fit both on edge nodes and on cloud scale. It's polyglot. So you can deploy in many different programming languages and frameworks, and it, it works with rapid prototyping. But here is the interesting tidbit, because you know, class is all about, is the, the, the applications we're talking about, it's about real time, it's about low latency computation. And in this case, we realized there are a few shortcomings of the serverless platform. One of them, for example, is that serverless functions are naturally stateless. Why is that? Because a serverless function is spawned out of the blue in response to an event. It doesn't know anything of the application context so far. So how do you make it aware? So one way to do that is passing information through parameters. That's a common mitigation. Another mitigation is to use the underlying data clay backbone and have the function retrieve information from it. But this actually leads us to the next issue of serverless platform, which is initialization and finalization overhead. And, 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 and this is the cause. First, a, a built-in issue with serverless platforms is the so-called cold start. When you spawn a new serverless function running in a container, that means a new container has to be created on demand, on the spot, populated with call, code, you pass the, the parameters to it, and then it starts executing. All of this takes time. This is just infrastructure overhead. And even after this happens, then there is the application overhead. Let's say our function needs to connect the data clay. That means it needs to open a session and communicate with the underlying data clay. And that also opening a session also takes time. So this is application overhead. Altogether, this might take a significant amount of time, which kind of is counterproductive when you think about real time response for events. So how do we mitigate that? One common technique we, we, we leverage is so-called warm start. How do we do warm start? Essentially, most serverless platforms, when they create a container that executes functions, they keep that container for some time more in memory after execution is complete because, they, because of, the, of the chance that another invocation might happen and they, they leverage the container that's already in memory, thereby avoiding the, the cost of cold start. So we actually leverage that intentionally by adding rounds of warm start throughout the execution. Another issue is finalization. Often after the result is all of the computation is already created and committed, the function still needs to update some statistics, generate some logs, close sessions. Again, that adds more time. So one way to handle this, and this happens in LithOps, which is my next, my, my next highlight, is we use asynchronous execution, meaning we let the function execute and we, we wait for the result to appear as opposed to waiting for the function to complete. And that, and that often saves a lot of time. And, and, and then the, the, the last aspect is scheduling. You're taking a pre-made, uh, if we're taking a pre-made uh, serverless platform such as OpenWhisk, it comes with its own scheduler. It comes with its own control of scaling, which means that you have to use what you have. But this is, this, this is not this this may be inappropriate for some use cases such as real-time response so how do we do that one mitigation is warm start because once you get the containers in memory you you've already passed the scheduling point but another mitigation we often had to do is actually go down to the to the to the core of the system whether it's openwhisk or the kubernetes cluster it is running on and actually tune them manually So that was that was serverless. The, the server. The first item was serverless fabric, and especially in the context of class. The next item, again in the context of class, is is one of the backends. Uh, I'm going to talk about specifically about LithOps and how we made how we tuned it to to do low latency computation again to meet the requirements of class. So what is LithOps? LithOps uh, um, basically is a Python library. That, is, that can be integrated into applications. 
and it allows massively parallel computation. It is basically a MapReduce engine. What is a MapReduce engine? Many of you are probably familiar with it from Spark, from Hadoop, from Flink. Um, the, it provides two core primitives. One of them is the map primitive, which takes a function and a data set and basically concurrently applies the function to every element of the data set, yielding a new data set. And the other is reduce, which is similar to map, only it involves an accumulator so that the result could be a sum, an average. It can be a single result or any, in the general term, a different size data set. So why would you use such an engine in the context of, uh, of class, in the context of real-time computation? Because of parallelism. The, the basic concept holds true in, in, in basically in any execution environment. The more parallelism you have that true independent computation, you can get lower total latency but for processing more data. So this is exactly how LithOps operates and you can see that in the bottom of the chart. Uh, the client code calls the map operation. Then what LitOps does basically, it takes the data set is provided as parameter, identifies all the elements and issues in independent invocations to each of these elements. And then we switch to the right, right hand part. And there you can see when it's running on OpenRisk and let's say in this tiny, very trivial example that I'm showing you on the slide, we have a concurrency limit of let's say up to four concurrent functions. Then basically this is the behavior we, we're seeing like four concurrent repeating rounds of execution. So we observed this behavior and this was not good enough because we need, we have some timing goal, a, a, a specific timing goals that we need to meet. So just letting it run best effort is not good enough. So what we did is we took it and we heavily optimized it for the class use case. One of the most important observations we made is that when we talk about big data in class, we are actually talking about a very large number of small elements. A very large number of small elements, we can optimize the communication in LitOps to work much better for this use case and thereby get, gain a specific speed up. So, um, how, what, what kind of communication? What kind of communication was it? Um, so, for example, one, one, of the core, uh, one of the core foundations of communication in LithOps between the, the client and the workers involves using uh, object storage, which is good for large, heavy elements, but really becomes a, a kind of an overhead when you use small elements. So we, we, we were able to optimize that, uh, that protocol and take the object storage out of the equation, thereby significantly speeding it up. Another important aspect was we sped up the, lo the, the launch of the workers themselves, but and then finally, one of the very important improvements was avoiding this round behavior that you're seeing here in OpenWisk. Instead of having this, this is a typical case, what, when, what happens when you have a lot of data elements and your concurrency limit is relatively small in comparison. For example, let's say you're allowed to run 1000 concurrent functions, but your data set consists of millions of elements. In that case, you need to, um, in, that, in that case, uh, what, you need, what you need to do is basically start at the same functions over and over and over again, pay again the cost of starting and stopping each function invocation just in response for and not just one more data element. So what we did that we identified that by chunking data elements together, we can get a significant speed up. So the overall result of the total optimization, for example, was one of the V2X cases. We, 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 uh, we, um, we, uh, we reduced the total cost of trajectory prediction from 4,000 milliseconds to less than 350, over 11 and a half times. The last, uh, the last highlight, I know I'm a little behind time. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm at the last item. So uh, the, last, the last item I'd like to talk about is how we make class analytics universal. Because, you know, class is supposed to work across the entire continuum. We're supposed to have analytics running the same way, both in the cloud and in the edge. How do we make that happen? Because edge, edge nodes are significantly different from cloud nodes. They're only loosely connected 
to the cloud and they have their own scheduling. They're actually independent instances and communication between edge and, and the cloud is not always reliable. So how do we give the same developer experience over a uniform platform where we have that loose interconnection? So what, the way we do it is by employing federation. Federation is a system we built on top of OpenWhisk that allows us to basically propagate software assets from one OpenWhisk instance that we say, for example, running in the cloud to multiple OpenWhisk instances that could be running in edge nodes. The, the, the origin is where we, we deploy the assets is called the leader, and then the targets where the, the, the assets are propagated to are the followers. The leader and the followers, of course, can be any OpenWhisk instances. So it doesn't have to be a cloud and edge. It can be also a multi-cloud scenario. But the idea here is that um, each follower, OpenWhisk basically becomes a programmable agent of the leader OpenWhisk. So what happens is if we have a, a kind of an application that is deployed as a set of open WISC functions. You deploy it in the cloud. You just press, um, you just press um, federate, and that entire application is propagated in an eventually consistent manner to all the designated edge nodes. So, and this is actually the main use case for federation. So basically, we're keeping the same user experience. However, federation is applicable also to non Open WISC assets, which I'm going to show in actually my near last uh, slide. Um, so this is a joint work we did with one of the partners with Unimore. We took uh, the so-called class edge application. This is not a designation of a specific node. It's actually name of an application that needs to run in the edge. A class edge is not an open WISC application. It's actually a long running stateful Docker service for edge nodes. Yet we were able to use federation to propagate it to the, to the edge nodes, the, the very same mechanism. How did we do that? So one cool feature about OpenWhisk, it has this capability, which we call project manifests. Project manifests are, con are actually containers of data that are considered open. The container itself is considered an OpenWhisk asset, so it can be federated. So the way we do it, we put the um, the new Docker contain the new version of the Docker application in the Docker registry. We create a manifest that contains the tag of the new application, and then we federate it to the edges. And then the other the opposite end of the federation, which is constantly running in each of the edge nodes and monitoring for updates, picks up this update and then knows it's a Docker it's a Docker container, pulls the the image to the edge node and make sure that the service is degraded gracefully and started afresh with the new version. And to summarize, to summarize my, my talk, so basically, as I said, I presented three main highlights involving class analytics. One is the event-driven serverless infrastructure based on Apache OpenWhisk, which is cool and productive and extremely easy to use. It's polyglot, auto-scaling, simple. And, but we needed to do some changes to make it work for class when we're doing low latency invocations. Okay. The second aspect I discussed was uh, that how we took one specific backend such as LithOps and adapted it to do low latency computation. Uh, and there and where we employ parallelism, but it needs significant optimization to match the, the to match the really low latency requirements of class under the constraints of class of big data consisting multiple small items and finally i showed you how we use federation to make the class analytics span both cloud and edge thank you very much for joining us today and joining my my talk thank and you I, I will now take uh, questions and answers so thank you yeah, thanks very much uh, for your presentation. That was very interesting. We, because we are running a bit late, we did receive a couple of questions on reducing latency, but I'm thinking that it's better to collect them all together and um, let's answer them during the, the Q&A slot that we have at the, uh, at the end of the event. So thanks again very much for your presentation.
So maybe we can continue with the next one. That is the presentation of Ruth Palmero from Atos. Ruth is going to talk about the class cloud computing, guaranteeing service management and performance. So Ruth, let me allow you to share your screen. And are you sharing your screen now? Uh, I would share my screen, yes. Thank you, Nicoleta. Uh, and thank you everybody for, for joining us today. Uh, I just wanted to say, because today is the last day of the of the project and that Tatos couldn't be there uh, in Modena with you, that uh, it has been a pleasure for all of the people that throughout the years has been part of this uh, of this project to, to work with, with you. So let me share my screen now. Perfect. Okay, I want to display ah uh, like this. Mm -hmm. Ah. Yeah, if you go to configuration. Yes, but I have another <laughs> and not okay. Oh now. Yes. Okay, finally. <laughs> I have uh, no, no, we still ah now oh. it's working. Okay, perfect. No, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Okay, let me minimize some things. Yes, yeah, so well, I, I'm going to talk about uh, again the cloud, uh, the class cloud computing continuum, and how we have worked to guarantee service management and and performance. Um, uh, mainly, we will describe uh, Rotterdam of our uh, container as a service uh, element, and also the SLA light that is uh, the component that we use to to enforce the uh, quality of service um, we will also see how we have improved the sla to to guarantee uh, time uh, to provide white time warranties okay uh, rotterdam as i say is a container as a service it allows deployment and management of, of containerized application in the in the Moderna data center. We have a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster, and it uh, it is able to deploy a uh, comps workflows. Uh, it supports also the management of multiple infrastructures like Kubernetes, OpenShift, Micro Kubernetes, Kubeless, and so on. And it can, uh, uh, other than the comps workflow, it can uh, run applications and also. Um, some uh, function uh, functions applications on the on the cloud to h continuum uh, either it has a inside the rotterdam we have the sla light it provides the possibility to refine uh, quality of service rules that controls the scalability and the elasticity uh, it's very easy to we have a single uh, json format for describing uh, both the the general application that needs to be deployed and also the um, the different um, quality of service rules that has to be applied to the to the tasks and uh, well um, we have a, a rest api interface to communicate with rotterdam so what we have in the in the Modena data center, we have two Kubernetes clusters. To, we have our private cloud. One is an OpenShift cluster, another is a Kubernetes cluster in which Rotterdam and the SLA Lite are running. So initially, the application will be defined a simple JSON file in which describing, as I said, quality of services and the and definition of the of the workflow. Uh, it will transmit it to Rotterdam that will deploy the application or the workflow in any of the infrastructure, either in the cloud or in the edge. And uh, it will actually communicate with the SLA light. It will create an agreement of a quality of service agreement and make sure that the, uh, that the quality of service is being met. Um, so the time that it is not being met is when it will scale uh, out or in the, um, the tasks, the workflow tasks. So this is an example first of what is the JSON file to define um, the, 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 um, the execution of a workflow, so the comps workflow. Initially, two replicas needs to be 
uh, created. Uh, later on, my colleague will define uh, what is comms and then what is the terms of replicas we can consider right now as workers or pods or elements that, that run in parallel. And uh, it also defines in the JSON what is the type of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, application that is going to be, uh, needs to be developed and the quality of service by a level, okay? Also, it, it is, uh, also it can be another type of, of, uh, of application, workflow, serverless functions. So the JSON find to define the, the application is, is quite easy. The SLLite receives also this uh, JSON from Rotterdam and it creates the SLA agreement. In the SLA agreement, it is defined what are the constraints that has to be met all throughout the execution of the different replicas. And in this case, uh, the initial number of replicas is four. And in case of a break of the this constraint that is a deadline miss. Deadline miss is actually like a, a, the time to execute this task is not going to be met, something like that. So uh, the Rotterdam will make sure that uh, there is an escalation. It, it will scale out to 1.5 uh, replicas. So from four, it will move up to six replicas. So this will be the, the, the flow of the, of the execution. Right, um, the application is is pushing the information of the deadlines into the monitoring, and the SLA is actually uh, from the monitoring uh, obtaining uh, the information to uh, supervise the meeting of the of the quality of service of the SLA. Okay, the time it is not being fulfilled, then Rotterdam will make sure that it is going to scale to the number of of workers that were defined in the in the agreement, so um, we perform a, with a with a short uh, comps uh, uh, workflows. Uh, this schema is working and it guarantees the time of execution. But we have realized that when the when the execution lasts longer, uh, there is an overhead of the scale scaling itself. So from the time the the deadline misses it is identified, since the time the the workers are are, are contacted and the new workers are launched, it comes is uh, um, a, again uh, starting the 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 execution with the new workers and so on. This time it presents an overhead. So what we thought is um, what we could uh, obtain a prediction of uh, uh, that could uh, help us to guarantee the time of execution. So initially we have added actually, uh, we have changed a little bit uh, the way in which we define our quality of service is not the deadline missing anymore, but we have the number of replicas and the value of the final execution time that is desired. This is what is being provided in the, in the JSON file. And uh, we have defined it a new component uh, that is the SLA predictor. It's actually a machine learning. And what we expect from it is, um, okay, we have uh, the desired uh, number of replicas and, and value of, uh, of final execution time, but will it be from previous um, executions? Can we, um, can we assess that this is going to be possible to have this execution with this number of replicas? If not, um, we can immediately launch the, the, the more efficient number of replicas with, and, as, and like that, avoiding the need to uh, scale later when the, when the, when the deadline missed uh, has to happen. So the, the SLA manager, when re it receives the, um, the initial um, quality of service um, rules, the conditions, it will actually ask the SLA predictor if this will be possible to be met. Right, this is a machine learning, and if it if not, it will actually give the actual number of replicas that is optimus for this execution and, and in this execution time, and like that, we avoid to to have to to scale from four to six replicas. So how did we did we design the SLA predictor? Well, we classified 
um, the state of the system, the state, the state of our cluster, our Kubernetes cluster. We did an exploratory data analysis and we classified, we actually uh, did a, a classification uh, training model and uh, we classified into low, normal and high levels. So depending on, the, on these low, normal and high levels and also the desired time of effect execution, we obtain the, the expected, the better uh, number of workers to be used. So actually we, we implemented the, the model training into a microservice with a, with a REST API. And the, what the, the SLA does is that it asks if the, uh, with four workers and an execution time of, of, uh, of uh, this, it's possible to, to finalize the, the task. And if the output is six, it means that the number of workers cannot be four, but six. And like that, we immediately from the very beginning of the execution of the, of the workflow, we know we have predicted what is the ideal um, number of, of workers that will, will finalize the, the, the job. And that's how uh, we, we avoid to have to scale. Yeah. So just to summarize, uh, I have explained how we have, uh, how we have Rotodon for the deployment and lifecycle management of, of uh, containerized applications that it works on uh, multiple infrastructures, that it, uh, it, it has a, a simple REST API to communicate with it and a simple, a simple JSON format to describe the application and that it provides uh, the possibility to define the quality of service rules um, for scalability and elasticity. And uh, we have also described how we have improved the SLA prediction with the SLA predictor, uh, our Rotterdam to to try to provide uh, more uh, time warranty, and uh, I, like that, our application scalability and elasticity will be triggered by informed quality of service uh, rules. And well, we have an initial um, training of the model to of, to obtain um, what is the um, the classification of the of the system in terms of, of abuses of resources before, um, before obtaining the, the, the actual uh, real state of the quality of service that is optimus. So, well, that's all. I think Thank I can you. have some time if you have some questions. Thank you, Ref. Thanks very much for this. Um, so we are running only a slightly bit late so if there are no, question, uh, no questions at this point, I think, again, we can move on with the next presentation. So let me share um, the agenda once again. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ruth, again, for your presentation. So maybe we can go ahead with Roberto's presentation so we can continue with the technical aspects of the project. This is a presentation of Roberto Cavicioli from Unimore on the class Edge Computing Layer, so AI infrastructure applied to smart mobility. Let's uh, continue then with Roberto's presentation. And uh, as I said before, feel free to write your questions in the chat or in the Q&A function. I make sure I collect them all and we will uh, have enough time to discuss all of them during the Q&A slot that you see here. So if uh, Roberto is ready. I can- Yeah, I'm ready. Give, perfect, I can give the floor to you. So I'm going to spotlight you again, okay. That's great. So you can uh, begin whenever you're ready, Roberto. Okay, thank you very much, Nicoletta. So hi everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Roberto Cavicchioli. I am a researcher here at Unimore. And now I will talk to you about the edge analytics that we have deployed inside the class software infrastructure. In particular, the need of these analytics was to be able to implement our use cases. So what is our main target? The target is, the target as you have seen in the demo this morning, is to have a real time obstacle detection and collision prediction that will send warning signals to smart vehicles, connected vehicles, and so on. So just to clarify for us, the connected vehicle is just a vehicle that has a GPS and it could have a small embedded board, like, uh, I don't know, a Raspberry Pi, an NVIDIA TX2, whatever, that is able to send to the infrastructure 
via our 4G private connectivity that we have, low latency communication about its own position. While on the other hand, the smart car is a car that also has sensors such as cameras, lidars, and so on, that we are able to fuse to ob obtain the correct position, not only of the car, but of all the other road users that are around the vehicle. Uh, and since our software infrastructure is scalable, uh, as shown previously, we um, imagined five different scenarios to be run. You have seen one, but we were able to uh, also test and verify also the other tests here. And we have divided this kind of scenario into two different um, functionalities. One is the virtual mirror. What does it mean? That I am not able to see anything, but the city sees for me. The other one is the two sources of attention, which is like uh, I am too focused on one side of the road because there is an incoming car or something like that. And on the other side of the road, something is happening and I'm not able to assess uh, the risk that there is incoming. So uh, for the scenario for the virtual mirror uh, here, for, for example, we can have uh, uh, two city cameras in the Atiralio street and a detected pedestrian and uh, the smart car. In this case, we can have, I don't know, a truck or a bus that is hiding the pedestrian that is crossing the road. While on the other hand, the, even if we have a smart car, the sensors are not able to detect what is behind the, uh, the, smart, the car, truck, or the bus. And therefore, the city will be the virtual mirror for the car. And since the pedestrian is crossing the street, the sensors of the city, so the, smart, the cameras, are able to detect it, provide its position, provide its trajectory, and therefore um, warn the car that there is a pedestrian in its own trajectory. On the other hand, the car is not available, to, is not able to detect and see the pedestrian on their own. The other one that you have seen this morning is actually the two sources of attention, because we have the Levante car that is exiting from a parking lot. While it is exiting, there could have been a pedestrian on the right hand side be um, before uh, going inside the roundabout. And therefore, the attention of the car might be focused on the pedestrian. While on the other hand, the Quattroporte car was approaching the same roundabout and going to cross the path of the Levante without any uh, attention to that part of the road. So, here, an alert can be raised from the city infrastructure to both the connected vehicles because the um, Quattro Porte maybe couldn't be able to uh, detect the car that is exiting from the parking lot. But since there is the camera that is seeing exactly the exit of the parking lot, that is detected and sent as, a, um, as an object, let's say, to the smart car. And on the other hand, for the Levante car, we have the warning for the approaching uh, Quattro Porte and for the crossing pedestrian. And to use, to actually uh, be able to run these kind of scenarios, we need the analytics. Some of the analytics have been already discussed by RS previously, and now we have to discuss how we are able to detect the correct position of each object inside the MASA. So the first thing that we do is that we detect all the possible road users, which can be cars, pedestrians, bicycles, buses, car trucks, and so on. Being able to detect this, then we obtain the bounding boxes on the camera image. Then from these bounding boxes, we can obtain the GPS position of the object. Why is that? Because we can assume that the lower part of the bounding box is where the object is touching the ground, and therefore the plane of the ground can be converted with its own. Uh, GPS latitude and longitude with a nomography matrix to the correct GPS. And then what do we do? We have somehow to track to obtain what is the uh, trajectory of each object. And to do so, what we need to do is to convert these two meters to be able to assess, you know, speed as uh, uh, meters per second or, or something like that. And therefore, we convert from the GPS to the meters in a different um, in, in a different coordination uh, system to be able to also feed our tracking uh, to be able to assess what are the different trajectories of all the objects. For detection, we use neural network. In particular, as also uh, Edu uh, Eduardo said this morning, we are using YOLO. 
you only look once. YOLO is, let's say, the state of the art with respect to detection network. And detection network, it means that when I have an image, I, I'm not interested in assessing if that is an image of a dog or a cat. That is a classification. Detection is where is the dog, where is the cat in my image. So to assess where the dog or the cat or other objects are, the image is um, in the YOLO algorithm. The idea is to um, distribute the different parts of the image inside the network to assess for each part of the image, how is the probability of that part being of some uh, category with respect to others, and then to join the different um, categories with the different uh, areas to obtain the final detection. And as of now, YOLO has been evolved. There is, as, as uh, Eduardo said, we do not only have YOLO versus one, we have versus three, versus four, and so on. But we modified YOLO. Why is that? Because uh, we needed speed for YOLO. So YOLO is implemented in C++ and also in Python. But what we needed to do was to accelerate it to be able to run on GPU. Why? Because our edge and fog nodes are GPU capable devices. And therefore, we optimized our YOLO using TensorRT. And we have uh, published this as TKDNN, which is an open source project inside class. Also, we retrained YOLO. Why is that? Because YOLO is usually trained, the, 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 the base uh, one, on the COCO dataset. COCO is a dataset from Microsoft that has inside 80 classes of different possible objects. We are not interested in cat or dogs. We are interested only in cars, pedestrians, and so on. Therefore, we retrained our network on two different datasets. One is the UAD track dataset, which is a Chinese, Chinese dataset that uh, contains images from street cameras, which is exactly how uh, what we need uh, for the street cameras in our city. And on the other hand, for the point of view of the car, we retrained on the BDD 100K dataset, which is the Berkeley dataset. And uh, this dataset contains segmentation and detection of objects that are from the point of view of a smart car. And therefore, we have trained two different, many different versions of YOLO to be able to provide the maximum accuracy in the detection for the different use cases that we are uh, solving. And we have different performances. Since in class we are interested in real-time capabilities, we are, have to be sure that the version of YOLO that we are using is not overpowering our device, or at least that it responds to our device, to our request, real-time request, in a suitable time. As you can see here, the different version of YOLO that are present mm, provide different capacities of frame per second computation. But if, you, if we go to the highest uh, frame per second that is in the YOLO version 2 uh, trained on the Berkeley that we have here, you see there are lower precision on the detection that are in the rows below about the people, the car, the trucks, and so on. While on the other hand, the highest precision is given by the YOLO version 4 trained on Berkeley. But as you can see, the number of frames per second that we are able to process at full precision or even at half precision is only 7.2 if we are on an edge node, let's say a TX2 or something like that. So to be able to use the most, the, the, the best possible trade-off between a very good detection and a very fast computation, we had to choose correctly. And that's why we, we were using the YOLO v3 in our demo before, because as you can see, YOLO v3 is able to run at 10 to 12 per, per frames per second, depending on the precision that you are using. But the maximum a priori, so actually the uh, capability of the, the, of the detection and the precision of the detection is between the best of the YOLO v4 and the worst of the YOLO v2. And as you can see, Coco goes very well on person, but drastically drops on everything that is not a person. So this is the result of our detection. As you can see from a camera, we can run at 12 frames per second. And as you, you see, we detect all cars in green, a person in purple, a truck in yellow in the background, and so on. While on the other hand, while we are on a car, with the different network that we have trained there, we are able to detect better all the objects that are at the same height of the camera instead of the camera being on top. And we can also detect 
traffic signs and other stuff that might be useful for the ADA system that are on top of the car, but these are not useful for our use cases because we don't care if there is a traffic sign or not. We just uh, we are just interested in the position of all the road users to be sent to the infrastructure. Then we talked about tracking because we need to track the object to be able to perceive their path and to predict their path. So what do we do for tracking? We filter every object using, as we said, the lower center of the bounding box to be able to see, okay, to say, okay, this is the place in which the detection says the object is touching the ground. Then we use an extended Kalman filter. The extended Kalman filter is a Kalman filter, which is a mathematical uh, filter to um, smooth the path that we are uh, detecting. And then we use the nearest neighbor technique to associate the bounding boxes of the same object between an object in a, in a previous frame and in a successive frame. Why is that? Because as someone was already requested, we track with IDs, but we do not take these IDs into memory. We will explain this also a bit later. We compute one tracker for each object that we detect. So we have multiple trackers for each object that we detect in our view. This is from a camera. As you can see, behind the car, there is a trailing road, uh, a trailing line of points also behind the pedestrian. And each color that you see of the trailing points is a different tracking. That it means that sometimes if we miss the detection for some frames of an object, that object is not anymore the same object as detected before, but we are able to re-detect the object and restart a new tracker to obtain the, the path and the prediction of the possible path of the, of the object. Also, the same thing, you can see what we do. We obtain this tracking, these paths, and we are able to re-project them onto the GPS position that we have on our, on our, in our city. So to be able to correctly position each object it's in its own position while, uh, we have, while we have to send this information to our connected cars as smart cars. And what is the performance of this tracker? Well, extended camera filters are really, really fast. Uh, on our edge node, since we are, we are also able to parallelize this on GPU, we are able to uh, have uh, about a three millisecond computation for computing the uh, trajectory and the tracking of 80 objects, while on a mobile edge node, which can be a PX2, a PX2, a Pegasus, and so on, we usually take 10 milliseconds to track 80 objects. But that's okay, because all of this is inside our end-to-end -end latency computation, and with respect to other kind of computation, this is very, very, very uh, small. And then anonymization. Why do we have to talk about anonymization? Because we are under GDPR rules. Uh, since GDPR uh, is very strict about uh, the knowledge of any kind of information about the people, about whatever we see in a video, what do we do? Then we just record the position of object without the ID. What does it mean? Whenever we detect an object, we translate that object as a record with no image recorded. And we have the time, the position of the object as latitude and longitude, the category of the object. So we only know that there is a person, a car or a bicycle or something like that. And the predicted path at that point in time. So the orientation and the speed of the object. We don't actually record we have, you have seen this morning in the demo that only for debugging purposes, we are doing that to be able to ensure that every object keeps the same ID if detected from a certain camera. But when we pass messages between our uh, software architecture, any of this information is not stored. And also in the aggregated time, this information is even lost for a single point because when we aggregate temporally, we only have the average number of person, the average speed, the average number of car and so on within one minute, 15 minutes, one day and so on. Therefore, we are compliant with GDPR and privacy needs of our citizens. Uh, to, um, 
to convey this information from to the different uh, cars and obtain this information from the cars, we deployed also, as, as was said before, a UDP message protocol. Since we wanted to have the lowest latency possible, we compressed the information to be a binary uh, information. So we weren't able to use uh, something uh, like XML or JSON because they are verbose. And therefore, due to, due to the low latency and low bandwidth that we have with our private G connection, we had to use uh, binarization. To, binar to binarize all of this information, we were able to assess that 50 to 100 objects that are detected inside the MASA only take less than one kilobyte of memory to be sent over 4G as a packet of data. And then that packet, even if it is, let's say, intercepted by a malicious attacker, is not able to be reconverted to information because it is compressed and binarized. And if no information about how the compression has been done, there is no way of obtaining back the data of each single node. And that's it. So. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto, for the presentation. Um, I do have a question for you, which I mentioned earlier. I think you largely, largely covered it already, but I'm going to ask it anyway, in case you want to add something more. So the question says, how did you manage tracking with GDPR besides anonymous data? Do you track the object IDs, uh, meaning to follow the development of a potential conjecture? Yeah, exactly. So we track the object ID and we keep the object ID in memory only during computation because we need to assess that the object is still the same to, to predict the position of the object in the future. So we only keep them while we are processing, but we do not store them. We only keep them and send the predicted trajectory in real time, but we do not store the predicted trajectory or the previous trajectory of the object because that is only done for us for the debugging project, for the debugging of the software architecture project. While when the car receives the data, it's only the warning of a possible collision, but there is no information also about that collision if, if it is with a pedestrian, a car, or something like that. We only knew, we only communicate that there is a possible collision, so a warning, without the need of sending any other kind of information that might disco disco disclose the source of that data. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. So thanks very much for your presentation and for answering this question. I think we can move on. Let me again share my screen, share the agenda one more time. So um, we can continue with the last uh, technical presentation for today. This will be presented by Eli Karzakli from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And the title of uh, Eli's presentation is Class Software Architecture, Efficient Execution of Real-Time and Advanced Mobility Functionalities in the Smart City. So whenever you're ready, Eli, you can start your presentation and as i said keep uh, sending your questions in the chat or in the q a function of zoom and we will discuss them all during the longer q a slot we have right after the presentation of ellie um, okay perfect hi, thank you, you. Uh, so my name is ellie karchakli i am a senior researcher at the barcelona supercomputing center and uh, what I will present is uh, the class of software architecture, that is the, um, the architecture that brings together all the components that we have described so far and is responsible for the deployment and uh, distribution and execution of the real-time uh, advanced analytics that, uh, that we have developed. Uh, so to begin with, I would first like to give you a quick overview of the challenges that we, we are facing and the need to develop a novel software architecture. So first of all, okay, uh, our objective was the distribution of the workflows and their execution. So distributed computing has been around for a while in the sense of uh, distributing the computation over a shared pool of resources, for example, in clusters. But uh, recently with the advances in cloud computing, telecommunications and networking, we have been shifting to the edge computing paradigm. So there, the big picture is that uh, we have a layer of sensors, for example, IoT sensors, the smart cards that we have here in class, uh, the network of uh, smart cameras, et cetera. 
and all these uh, sensors generate information. And sometimes they have some limited processing capabilities. Then we have the edge layer that is where some computation takes place close to the data sources. And then we have the cloud layer. So all this pool of resources, we call them the compute continuum that spans from the edge to the cloud. And our aim is to be able to execute and distribute all the computation across the whole compute continuum. Now, there are several challenges in that because first of all, we have to deal with a massive number of heterogeneous resources that are also geographically distributed. So in our example, we have a network of cameras across the city, we have the smart cars that are moving, etc. So if we want to keep the computation close to the data sources and the data sources keep moving and are heterogeneous, this is a challenge. Uh, the second challenge is that we have heterogeneous networking. So as uh, Luca already presented, we have different types of connectivity. We have uh, wireless, we have uh, the 4G network, we have uh, fiber optics, we could have 5G in the future. So each different type of communication comes with different capabilities in terms of throughput, in terms of latency, and in terms of reliability. So then finally, we also have heterogeneous computing resources. Uh, so heterogeneous in the sense of uh, uh, computing and storing capabilities in terms of architectures where we can have GPUs or CPUs and in terms of operating systems. So it is very challenging for a developer to design an application uh, data analytics that can run over this highly heterogeneous infrastructure. And it's very challenging to distribute this workflow and ex make sure it is executed to the right place in this whole compute continuum so as to ensure the real-time guarantees that are needed by the use cases. So this is the novelty that is introduced by class, by the class of the architecture. So I will just do a very quick overview of the whole, of the whole picture of the class of the architecture. So here you can see the different components that have been already presented by my, by my colleagues. So first of all, we have the data analytics platform that has been presented by RS uh, with the serverless framework of Express Open and OpenWISC and the different analytics backs, backends that are supported. For example, the map reduced based lithops and the task based COMSAPI that I will present later. And then we have the compute continuum where we have the cloud components already presented by Root and the edge software components that were previously presented by Roberto. And the missing link for all this is the computation distribution layer that is uh, where the COMS framework that I will present lies. Uh, along with the data clay that is uh, a distributed data store uh, responsible for handling the data transfer wherever they are needed. So the main um, contribution of this software architecture uh, are that they, it facilitates the development of the complex data analytics, handling all this heterogeneity. heterogeneity. Uh, it, uh, is if it handles the distribution of the computation across the compute continuum supporting the concurrent execution of the different analytics whenever possible. And also it supports interoperability, scalability, and portability. So let's see how our complex data analytics are executed over the class of the architecture. So if you see here uh, at the left part, we have the data sources, which are the cameras and the smart cars in the case of class. Then we execute the object detections at the edge, at the edge components. And then in the fog nodes that uh, we have at the city of Modena, at the mass area, we execute the rest of the um, real-time uh, functions of the workflow, which is the object tracking, the deduplication, and then the creation of the data model where the information is generated, and the federation of this information to the cloud. And then at the Modena cloud, we also have uh, the execution of the two different use cases. On one hand, we have uh, the OpenWISC cluster executing the list of tasks of trajectory prediction and collision detection, uh, which uh, then generate the alerts. And we also have the air pollution use case that is uh, used, that is executed over the cloud components. Uh, and uh, this transfer of data from the fog nodes to the cloud is handled by the data cloud. So here is a mapping of this workflow I just presented with what we saw earlier in uh, our live demo. So here you can see the workflow of the fog nodes. So as Roberto already presented in the previous ses uh, session, we have the object detection that in this um, image is represented by these blue boxes, 
around the detected cars and vehicles. And then we have the object tracking, where the different objects uh, are tracked across consecutive frames. And uh, this results to the position of the objects that are uh, represented by these green dots. And then we have the, the duplication of um, the input from the different sources, for example, the three cameras that we have in the demo, and then the creation of uh, the data model. And this result, uh, yeah, this results to the generation of a snapshot. So snapshot is just a data structure where we uh, describe everything that has been detected on this frame. So in fact, we have all the different objects. We have an object ID that later will not be stored uh, due to anonymization. We have the type of the objects, etc. And then for each type of objects, for, for each specific object, we have a history of events that correspond to the detected position and velocity, etc of the object, of the same object in consecutive frames. So then the next step is to pass this uh, snapshot to the cloud. So from the fog nodes, this information is passed with the help of data clay to the cloud, where we have the data knowledge base that keeps a record of all the different snapshots along the execution that of course are periodically erased uh, um, whenever needed. So then the data stored in the NATA knowledge base that are the output of the workflow presented before are then passed to the trajectory prediction function that calculates the predicted trajectories of the object that have sufficient history. So this tra these predicted trajectories are then updated in the model and then are passed to the collision detection function. So the collision detection will uh, make an estimation of all the possible collisions and generate the alerts that can be sent to the car. So this is the final output where the trajectories are marked by, red, by the red lines and the different uh, bullets, the red bullets are the estimated trajectory in the next 500 milliseconds. And then we have the detected collision. So how do we go on to develop this type of application and distribute it over the compute continuum? So the first thing to do uh, this, uh, this has been done in class using the COMS framework. So COMS is an open source uh, framework for the distribution and execution uh, of analytic workflows. And it can be found in the link I, uh, I pass here. So the first step is to develop the sequential code in any typical language like Python, Java, or C. So for example, we have here the different functions. To, to get the detected objects from the TKDNN, to track them, to duplicate them, and then create the data model and send it to the cloud. And we have a, a loop where we uh, access all the available sources, we do the detection, the tracking, and then we the duplicate, etc. So how do we transform this sequential workflow into a, a distributed workflow? So with COMS, this is pretty easy because we just need to annotate the tasks to be distributed with a specific decorator, this task, and mark their dependencies. So we just go to its function declaration, we put this, um, this uh, delimiter, and then we explain the dependencies. For example, the tracker must receive uh, the frames from the detection and must receive the track position from the previous frame. Uh, that the duplication must receive all the track information from all the trackers that are uh, referred to the same timestamp, etc. So once we do this preparation, then the, our sequential program is converted to a parallelized program. And the, another key point is, is that this is agnostic to the underlying infrastructure in the sense that we don't need to take care uh, to, uh, of where its task will be executed because this will be done uh, automatically by comms. And I will show you how in the next uh, slides. So when we uh, do all this uh, coding preparation, what COMS does after is that it generates the task dependency graph. So this is an example of uh, the task dependency graph for two consecutive frames of the same camera. So as you can see here, we have uh, the different tasks that, have, that are generated and the lines between them are the dependencies. For example, we see that uh, we have to detect first the first frame and then the second marked by V3. And of course, this gets more complex as we add more sources. If we get a second camera, we'll, we have the detection and tracking of this camera, 
that then will be the duplicated jointly with the other one. So it becomes more and more complicated. And if we wanted to see the task dependency graph of one second of processing from a single camera, it would look like this. And take into mind that in class we have up to 16 cameras. So this is fairly complicated, but the developer does not need to, to handle this complexity. This will be distributed by comms. So once we make all these uh, declarations, the next step is to, to take care of the deployment. So in order to do the deployment, all we need to do is provide a configuration file, an XML file with the available computing resources. So in our example in class, we have the different fog nodes, four fog nodes in particular, that are dockerized. So we launch the master because uh, COMS has a master and worker architecture. We launch the master, the master gets this configuration file and then automatically deploys the workers. And if we want to connect to the cloud where the Rotterdam cluster is also deployed as described by root, we can do that through the same configuration file by uh, putting the specific configuration for this Rotterdam API. So once this deployment is uh, complete, then the master will distribute the different tasks wherever needed based on the scheduling policy that is implemented. And then at the time of execution, the task will be distributed and executed in parallel whenever parallelism can be supported. So this is a simple example from just execution of uh, at one uh, worker with four cores, and we see how all the tasks are running and fully utilizing uh, the available resources. So to finish this presentation, I want to give some more details about the scheduling. So since we want to target real-time guarantees, we need to provide some advanced scheduling capabilities. So what we do is first we do an offline profiling of the task that we want to execute and the, available, the capabilities of the available resources. So we generate the tasks and we execute them um, a number of times over all the available resources in order to obtain statistics about the task execution times and the data transfer times. So once we do this for all the tasks and all the resources, we obtain the statistics and then we apply the task scheduler. Now, uh, the task scheduler that we have uh, developed for the class project is based on heuristics that aim to minimize the end-to-end -end response time. So based on these heuristics, this is just an example of how the scheduling would look like. So the different tasks are allocated to the resources based on the time, the estimated time that they need for completion and making sure that specific deadlines are met. So in this example, we can see the specific deadlines of each task uh, individually and the end-to-end -end response time. Now, the key advantage of this is that it enables us to have an idea and estimation of the end-to-end -end workflow response time. And this enables us to say that if we execute our workflow in this specific uh, uh, architecture and infrastructure, we can guarantee that it will be executed in this time. Now, of course, we cannot guarantee it always because there are unpredictable events. So what happens if, for example, the fog node 2 comes down or becomes congested for a reason? So our workflow is capable of adapting to this change in real time. So if, for example, fog 2 becomes unavailable, then the, uh, the comms orchestrator will notice the increase of the response time and that the deadlines of the different tasks are missed. And in that case, it will reschedule the tasks making sure uh, that everything is executed smoothly. So the task will not be assigned to Fogno 2 anymore and will be allocated to the remaining available resources. Now, of course, this will lead to the calculation of a new response time, but this is what we can do with the, the given resources that we have. So concluding, uh, we have seen the capabilities of the class of our architecture, and we have seen how it can aid to the development, distribution, and execution of the complex analytic workflows over the complete compute continuum in a way that is transparent to the programmer and agnostic to the infrastructure. And we also saw how we can provide real-time guarantees while supporting the reallocation of resources and the scaling also in real time. So that's all. I'm out of breath. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ellie. 
that was fantastic. Thanks very much for your presentation. And uh, thanks to all the speakers, actually, because this wraps up all the presentations for today. Well, apart from the final one from uh, Eduardo, but let's move on. Let me share my screen once again to just uh, check the agenda. So I think now is the perfect moment to have our longer Q&A slot. So if uh, the speakers in the Modena room can gather, and we also have Ruth, of course, from Spain online. So let's uh, use this um, time for any questions and answers that uh, our attendees have had. I, I already have a few that I have uh, had collected earlier. So let me stop sharing now and let me also spotlight root. Okay, so perfect. Let me ask um, the first questions that we had. So the first question says, how have the components communicated between uh, the cloud and the vehicle? Um, the REST API MQTT. That I guess you, 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 you can answer. Okay, so as discussed before, uh, we deployed the lightweight protocol, which is the master protocol is in using UDP. And since we had to communicate from the cloud to the, to the car, we used this kind of strategy. We used a more, let's say, flexible way of doing that using MQTT to be able to communicate from the cloud to one of the fog nodes. And then since the fog node can access the 4G network, it will be using the MASA protocol to send the notification to the car. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. Let's move on to the second one. So we have a question that says, that although um, it, maybe it's not in scope to optimize the latency, have you measured it? For instance, in the live demo that you showed, did you um, attempt to measure latency, optimize? Yes, we have, yes. Okay, so yes, we have done this. Um, so uh, the latency of of the of 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 the end-to-end -end workflow, meaning from the time we are uh, gathering the, uh, the cameras, the, the images from the cameras, till the time this information is at the cloud, at the cloud level, ready to be consumed uh, by um, by uh, Ethops and by Rotterdam. It's we are taking in average between uh, 70, 80 milliseconds up to 120 milliseconds then in the cloud uh, and this is you probably can can answer better this this question how much latency we are we are taking on the cloud level so uh wh what we did is basically we benchmarked the computation in the cloud uh under different loads uh i can tell you that for subs for subsets of objects that are below below um 200 objects we get uh, we get less, some uh, more commonly less than 200 millisecond the computation, but uh, of course we stressed the system to much higher loads than what we get in just uh, using synthetic data, and there we were able to push it up to let's say some reasonable limit of 500 milliseconds, which is something we derived from a stopping distance calculator given the, the road conditions and the climate and all that. The perception time, the total perception time needs to be no more than 500 milliseconds, give or take. So this is this was always also the, the limit that we did for benchmarking the cloud computation. And in the and, and we saw that we were able to process uh, uh, for collision detection, for example, groups of 1200 pairs of collisions in 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 such a time for 500 milliseconds. Yeah. And in the end, from the cloud to the to the car for the actual is less than 20 milliseconds because uh, there is the communication from MQTT to the fog node, which is instant, mostly less than a millisecond. And then there is the delay of the 4G connection, which is about 60 milliseconds, mm -hmm. 16 milliseconds. So at the end, we are uh, the project has been as it is was uh, com 
amending before try to to provide end to end we get the data the 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 car received the alert within the range of uh 500 mill milliseconds at considering the speed of vehicles in the city it's uh it's a it's a reasonable uh it's a reasonable time yeah if you look at the video for example the good result that edu showed the good vi result video that edu showed it's almost visible there where you see the notifications appearing between half a second sometimes more maybe even a full second before the actual collision could could occur mm -hmm. thank you thanks very much and there is well, it's an, and it's an additional question about latency, which I'm pretty sure you've covered already. I'm going to ask it anyway, and then you confirm. What is the additional latency introduced by the cloud computation? Yes, so, I think, yes, I think we, we have answered. But yes. if, if uh, you want to, to, to comment, but I, I think we have answered. So as I said, we stressed, we stressed the, the, the computation at various uh, scales using synthetic data to to uh, to go beyond just the real the real loads and the numbers we got for the gross computation uh i did not i i'm not sure we yeah we we actually benchmarked the overhead it's actually detailed in the forthcoming deliverable that is about to be submitted for class and um um I'm trying to recall more exact numbers there, but I would I would say that more often the overhead was around. Uh, we we sometimes were able to get it to less than twenty percent of the actual uh, the the total computation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I move on with a second question. Uh, not second, but the next one that says, um, again, maybe it's out of scope, but maybe not. The question says, how is the energy efficiency at the edge computing achieved? It was mentioned by Edu at the beginning of his presentation. Okay. Um, so so this, is, this is not something that uh, class has been addressed. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that, that we are not dealing with energy efficiency, but what we have done is uh, considering or benchmarking uh, the different analytics on different type of pressure architectures as uh, over to shown. And, and, and we have tested a number of different devices, starting from the NVIDIA Jetson TX2. That, that if I recall correctly, the energy is between 10 watts and 30 watts, more more or less depending on 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 the modes. We have been also using uh, Javier Jetson Javier uh, that it's a bit more powerful. It's more in the 20, 30 range, uh, and then we are also being tested in more powerful uh, uh, Nvidia boards uh, based on Volta, which there. The power, the power is significantly yeah. higher. Uh, just as a comment on the in the beginning of the project, while we were choosing the architecture on which to run our analytics, we also benchmarked different kind of uh, platforms such as FPGAs or uh, standard ARM CPUs. But for the needs of the computation of the analytics, in particular for the inference we were tight to use uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs because otherwise we weren't able to obtain the kind of performances that we were uh, needed to achieve to gather to uh, obtain our real time requirements. And, 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 and here let me let me emphasize kind of a side comment not related to energy, but 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 I think it's it, it, it is a good a, a good point to emphasize it. So we are running the exact same infrastructure, so the exact same workflow on different platforms. So we are running this on the Jetson families. We are running this on more powerful families, more powerful NVIDIA families. Uh, just to, to stress that the portability, I was I was I was mentioned at the at the at the very beginning. And in fact, there is I I've seen a question that perhaps uh, at some point and. Um, Nicoletta, you are going to 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 make it. So let me take this opportunity to to, to advance to this to mm -hmm. question that was about something like if this is portable to other cities, and uh, yes. Absolutely, absolutely yes, because mm -hmm. 
portability is one of the our key uh, performance indicators. Okay, so the whole thing can be run wherever we, we want. We are not tied to and to Nvidia's as well, so the, we can use any other type. The only thing that is that this has been implemented off top of Nvidia's, as Roberto said, because the performance was was very very nice. But our technology can be ported in any platform. Even we could do it in a in a small Raspberry Pi. The performance, of course, would be a disaster. But but this perfectly <laughs> it only depends on the analytics. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, it should be stressed also that we are not tied specifically to V2X applications. Class is about doing real time processing of big data in the cloud and the edge in general. Okay, so you could do that on a factory floor, just like you do it in a V2X just like you do it in controlling some fleet of machinery, some sensor, some, some sensoric response to in other platforms, etc. Yeah. So I think you you are covering different questions that they came. So, for example, there is one about a V2X that says, is the platform ready to work with V2X C V2X protocols? These I'm not familiar with the B2XC protocol. Cellular, cellular B2X. Yeah, we, are, we are ready since we are using 4G and we have also uh, other projects in the MASA area that are working mm -hmm. with DSRC or other kind of protocols, in particular for automotive. So we are able to use the same architecture because the only thing is that the communication media will be a different... Uh, how, how, however, it should be stressed that one fundamental difference when it comes, for example, to running on top of a 5G Mac is what Edu uh, proposed earlier about not owning the infrastructure because it's unlikely that in that case the Mac would be dedicated to class. It's more likely that this Mac will be provided by a third party, by a telecom organization, where, where the class architecture would be in fact renting or leasing resources from that Mac and using them as, 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 their, as the edge devices in effect. And that and that and the lack of hardware control poses some some interesting challenges, as as Edu explained later explained earlier about um, about providing the same quality of service. But this is uh, this is a this is I believe this is a, a topic that is going to be looked to looked into very deeply in the near future. Mm -hmm. And there is another question that you already um, touched upon, but. It says, is the class platform open source and ready for reproduction? What is its maturity and business model? <laughs> okay, okay. So it's open source, yes. but it is not a product. It is a prototype. It's a prototype. So there are, the, in fact, there are the, the maturity of the components are different. So uh, there are components that are very mature that has been developed. Um, for example, comms, it's quite mature uh, component has been developed for the last 10 years at DSC. OpenWIS is definitely a mature component. Data Clay is not mature at all. So, so um, um, there we are, we, are, we are having some difficulties. I mean, it's, it's just, um, uh, um, I said, it's a prototype that can be test. So the message is it works end to end, but it's a prototype. And as a prototype, there there can there can be failures. But uh, but if you think about the general picture, class bears a message of a software architecture, which means if you put if you organize the components in such a way that these provide specific functionalities and capabilities, and these we can deliver an interest uh, interesting and useful applications on top of them. Mm -hmm. So. So uh, this, this, this is actually a broader message than just locking down into each specific, it doesn't have to be open whisk. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be, you know, for orchestration, for, for combining orchestration, serverless, data propagation, and all these, all these capabilities. And, it, mm -hmm. and it is, this, this is an excellent comment. Mm -hmm. So all, that, all, all the proposals we have been, uh, we have developed in, the project can be extended to other type of platforms. Right. So this probably answers uh, this additional comment that says that 
the, this is a good approach, the neutral host uh, business model, um, but what about the scalability of it? Um, scalability in terms of um, more resources, scalability in terms of workflow complexity. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are 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 there are, there are different types of uh, different types of of. Uh, there is yeah, there so is an answer to that from the person that asked about it, and uh, he says workflow and resources. Okay, good. Okay, so um, so here um, scalability. So in terms of uh, resources, the more resources you have, uh, the more potential. Um, communication impact uh, you, you have. Um, in this case, our analytics, our, sorry, our uh, heuristics to distribute the workflow takes all this into account, but this makes the scheduler more complex. Um, the more, and then this, the, the same thing applies to the workflow description. The bigger it is, the, it is uh, the workflow, the more difficult it is to find, let's say, a good solution, or the heuristic will will be difficult to find a more good. But here we are. I'm really thinking of scaling to to a lot of nodes. Okay, so just to put you an example, comps that we are using is being applied to the Arenostrum super computer. There we are having five thousand nodes. Okay, so 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 in that in that respect, but of course there, there is a very controlled scenario in which communications are through infiniband so uh, it's 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 um, it's much less complex like like in the heterogeneous scenarios we are uh, we are we are dealing with but in any case I think we are prepared classes prepared to scale to 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 larger, I I don't know if uh, you want to comment something else. Um, so some components have built in innate abilities, you know, for scaling up, scaling out, you know, uh, open list. Uh, it, it they are they are already prepared to launch multiple control points, multi and and a large, very large scale of of functions. But but uh, the overall, you know. Uh, any questions for scale? You know, we can we can always present a good prediction, but eventually, what the real testimony is empirical results. So right now, we believe we can scale the current prototype to um, to larger scale. How much is that? Where do we find new bottlenecks? Because we have found bottlenecks in the past and got around this. I I, I think a, a fair answer would be you know <laughs> we'll have to test and see. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. Next question. What about extra power consumption? Have you done an analysis on that? Oh, energy. And, and power, extra power consumption. Have you done any analysis on that? A great part of the roads has no access to power for these attendant edge nodes. Okay, okay. So, so no, so we have not focused on, on energy at all so we have not let's say we have not make an analysis of the trade-off between what is the extra energy we are and we we need in order to have a more powerful machine so this this was not uh, the i mean energy is not focus of the project so we have not addressed this okay it's not in the scope and i think i have a final question that it's a very good one um, to post last because it's about the future. So it says, what is the plan, <laughs> what about the future? plan post class? What are the open challenges ahead? <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I was, I was in fact expecting this uh, question. Um, so uh, the challenges are, 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 are many, many, many. Um, so the first one um, um, that I that I already mentioned before and that Eres has already commented is is that first one we are considering uh, full control over the resources and this is okay for now but this is not going to be in the in the near future which is not going to be the case because the cloud model is going to to be extend or or I think uh, that the cloud model is going to be extend to the edge. 
as well. So there, there are going to be much more difficulties in order to control. Then there is of always the 5G, right? Um, so where, so when, whenever we are, we are uh, 5G enters in the game, and then you, you also can control the way uh, communications are 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 done. It's 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 it's, it's also uh, a challenge. Then there is the, the the cloud wall. It's it's evolving constantly with new you know open source projects that with with new techniques uh that 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 really need, need to need to stay in tune for example the serverless model uh is constantly evolving yes it's constantly evolving so far we have applied this to this to the cloud level but the next step is what about to apply this to the edge level to provide another extra layer of abstraction uh it's, it's not just consider general issue for example of non-functional requirements in applications in general I mean, think about it when you deploy your code, obviously you have your functional requirements because which means I need to accomplish this task A, task B, task C. I need to do this stuff. This is, this is what my application needs to do. Okay. But then there is the non-functional requirements because you need certain degree of reliability. You need certain latency. You need certain control of locality, interaction with other components, so-called composability other many other features that are actually very very hot requirements for modern applications because when you apply for enterprise for example you got numerous requirements of reliability of sustainability of durability of data etc cetera, etc cetera. and doing and, and trying to provide a real general purpose solution to all these non-functional requirements is becoming an extremely arduous chore. Yeah. So, so this trying to design forward is, I would say, uh, honestly, I mean, I, I would say, let's uh, just taking a subset of these non-functional requirements yeah. and doing in this ever-changing world where you get less and less control is going to be an extremely interesting that is, that is, uh, research that challenge for that the forthcoming. Is, that is food for a, for a lot of research. And now, uh, for example, the automotive industry is starting, you know, to to to, to shift uh, their attention to 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 cloud and and, and to edge. And then, as it is was saying, you need to 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 port all the requirements. So, how you can execute a safety critical system in an edge cloud environment? In the class, we have tried to provide some light. Okay, in this in this huge enormous challenging, by uh, by uh, investigating on the real time, but there are many other um, requirements. Security is another huge requirement. Energy that you energy mentioned. that you just mentioned. Safety in the general term that there is a resiliency, robustness, reproducibility. I mean, there is there is there is a lot of uh, research topics that uh, we really hope to, that, that, mm -hmm. that we can continue pushing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think that that question was perfect to wrap up this Q&A slot. So we already answered quite a lot. Thanks everyone for asking questions. Uh, it was a very interesting part of the, of the event, I think. And uh, let me share my screen again just a final time to share the agenda so that Edu can uh, have some time to prepare for his very final conclusion it's going to be a very short very short conclusion uh, about the event and about the project and i have already shared some links in the chat for everyone uh, to see i have shared our website, also the class GitHub channel, where you can find the software components uh, there. I have also shared links to our social media, so it would be great if you follow us on there and uh, stay tuned with the, with the things that we're going to do from now on. Of course, the, the project is finishing, but we're, we're still planning to get out um, more material, so stay tuned. And also don't forget that the recording of this event will be posted online and um, you can just uh, catch catch it up whenever you have uh, the time. So Edu, if you're ready, 
we could ready. have great so we can um just have your final presentation there okay you so it, this is going to be very very fast so let me summarize so here um i would like you to 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 have two take home messages um so the first one is about the software architecture okay in which uh, the objective of the software architecture is 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 focusing on 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 try to to enhance the development deployment and execution of complex workflows across what we call the compute continuum uh, taking into account uh real time requirements and really focus on the productivity okay so so enhancing the uh the the, the productivity to facilitate this this design and execution of the complex workflows and also um um and 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 and, and the second message is is the is is the use of this software architecture uh, in order to implement uh, these two uh use cases um based um, um for the collision uh, detection to potentially be included in the in in future advanced driving assistance systems and the capability of monitoring in real time what is the level of pollution of a given area based on the actual mobility of the different vehicles that that is where it is it is it is the 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 benefit um just let me show you the last technical uh slide um this slide i mean this is this this is the demo uh that uh that this is the demo that uh you have seen in, in which the two maserati cars were uh, were uh, approaching and and the city plus the information from from the car were fused in order to detect the collision and this is precisely what we have been uh, showing you um, during the different presentations, how we are describing the workflow uh, uh, using both combs uh, and uh, lithops, how we are deploying this, okay, using our uh, scheduling mechanisms, and how the different technologies that we have been pres uh, presenting to they interacts among them in order uh, in order to make this execution uh, possible and my last slide is just to say thank you thank you very much for the whole consortium and especially for the last part of the year because the this use case uh, has been very challenging but has been very challenged to do it all with all the team locked down without the cars okay um so the our original plan was to start uh the test in april 2020 but you know what happening in in april 2020 and in fact we had access to the i mean we had access to to, to everything again with the whole team in may 2021 and so i think with one year the team has done an extraordinary work uh, in order to try to test a use case without having the cars, which is which has been quite challenging. But considering that the, these difficulties, I think I think all the, all the team has done a great job. So the only thing I can do is to say thank you to the consortium, and that's all from my side. Uh, now we have uh, so thank you very much for attending Thank you. Uh, this event has been a real pleasure to be here as well um and now Nicoletta, i think it is it, we have prepared a, a short um, a short video yes yes i think it's it's time to show this video just to conclude this event and the project um i would suggest that all the attendees stay tuned is a two minute video um, that we made in Modena with all the cars and the use cases so it would be great if people stayed to watch it and um, yeah I would also like to thank everyone the speakers that um, were great today presenting uh, all the attendees that uh, came to our event today it was a pleasure uh, to have you and to answer all your questions and stay tuned, that's from my side.
Imagine a city where data is shared between the city and cars in real time to implement smart mobility functionalities for traffic management and advanced driver assistance systems. This is exactly what the CLASS project is doing in Modena, Italy. The extraction of knowledge from data coming from sensors located in the city and in vehicles requires to effectively combine edge and cloud computing paradigm into a single computing infrastructure. To do so, CLASS has developed a new generation software architecture for the development and execution of advanced big data methods that will enhance the interaction between vehicles and citizens in urban areas in real time. The CLASS software architecture integrates technologies from various computing domains, including IoT, edge and cloud computing, that combined with mobile communications, enable the extraction of knowledge in a fully distributed ecosystem that spans across the compute continuum. The architecture has been evaluated in the Modena Automotive Smart Area, MAZA, a real-life urban laboratory equipped with sensors and advanced connectivity, in which two high-tech equipped Maserati cars provide continuous monitoring across five defined scenarios. The class technology allows the data collected by Mazza and the two vehicles to be efficiently processed and combined to increase the sensing capabilities of vehicles and cities, therefore helping to anticipate hazardous situations, creating a safer mobility scenario for future smart cities. Grazie al progetto CLASS abbiamo potuto testare le più innovative tecnologie per lo sviluppo della Smart City, eh, aprendo la strada per innovazione nell'ambito della mobilità urbana e migliorando la qualità di vita dei cittadini. CLASS has combined the proud Italian tradition of Ian's car with the needs of modern smart cities, enhancing the capabilities of connected vehicles. We really hope that CLASS will contribute to the way smart cities are evolving in the near future.